Okay. Uh, last week I talked about uh, the challenges facing uh, not only Jewish but Gentile Christians from pagan uh, backgrounds. How do you worship in a system that has no priest, no temple, no sacrificial system, uh, no buildings anywhere to worship? Worship. How do you create this when you've come out a history of a, of a tradition where you had temples everywhere? You had, in, at least in Jerusalem, an enormous temple. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. You had a priesthood, a high priest, had all these things. Now you don't have any of it. How do you worship? And we can't go through that again, but Hebrews answers that question, saying, yes, we do have a high priest in Jesus. Yes, we do have a sacrificial system, but it only needed one sacrifice, and that was Jesus, and so on and so forth. So what we learned and had was uh, a, a little rehearsal of what we believe now. But in fact, it took a long time to get there. And so this morning we want to talk about, uh, as we talked about them a little separately last week, Gentiles and Hebrew or Jewish Christians. Today we want to talk about Jewish Christians. How did this whole thing get started and what happened? And I was uh, talking to a, a friend of mine, a clergy, and he asked me what I was going to do. And I said, told him about this and he said, well, I got a question for you. Who cares? Well, you know, that's actually a good question. Why should you care about early Jewish Christians? And why should you care about what happened after we split? Well, the first and obvious answer is we come from them, not the other way around. So if you want to understand who we are, you need to understand who they were. Secondly, there are some promises with regard to the Jews in Romans that we rarely look at, and we're going to start there this morning, that should guide our relationships with Jews, which have not been good over 2,000 years, to say the least. We have persecuted them nearly to extinction. And so we want to take a look at how did this stuff happen, and does this have anything to say to us today? So I want to start in Romans uh, the 11th chapter, and he's talking about uh, the Gentiles stumbling and not, I mean, the Jews stumbling and not accepting Jesus. So, beginning in verse 11, Paul writes, Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He goes on to say that they are, and this is an important point for us, they're the actual branch. We're not. <laughs> We're just grafted on branches the way you take a, a, a good, healthy root stock and you cut a slit in it and tie on some branches and it grows, they are the true rootstock. Paul makes that absolutely clear for the rest of the chapter and then goes on to say, at some point, all Israel will be saved. So how did it get to this point? Because uh, at verse 25, chapter 11, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. So Israel's rejection of Jesus, according to Paul, comes about by whom? Who created this situation? God. 
God hardened the hearts. This is a passive here. They did not harden their hearts and reject Jesus. God did what? He hardened their hearts. Now, why would he do that? That's what we're going to talk about today. Why would God harden the hearts of the children of promise in favor of the rest of the world? Anybody got a guess before we get started? The Christians, the early Christians, those who were part of those first days were all Jews. If we go back to, we're going to spend most of our time in Acts today, if we go back to the second chapter of Acts, and we look at what happens on the day of Pentecost, it's, a, it's interesting to note. Now there were staying, this is Acts 2, in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Each heard the apostles speak in their own language, and it says, how is this happening? Because we are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. That's the whole Mediterranean world. But who are they? They're Jews. Exclusively, either born Jewish or having converted to uh, Judaism, having undergone uh, circumcision for males, and undergone all the things that we need that you need to do to become a Jew, but they're all Jews. We get it. Okay, so we need to understand all the first Christians are who? Jews. Not a Gentile among them. I may have to actually use one of those. But so far, there are 3,000 of them. And in the days that go on, more and more added, they're all Jews. And who, uh, what, who and what changes this situation? It changes with the creation of the first deacons. Now, Peter, James, John, I think Andrew, have all been called before the Sanhedrin, and they've all been told, stop preaching. At this point, it's called the sect of the Nazarenes. Quit talking about this guy. And he, and Peter famously stands up in scriptures and says, God commissioned us, and we can do nothing else, and we'll keep up. So a man named Gamaliel II, I mean the first, we're talking about Gamaliel I, and that becomes important later on, comes out and he says to them uh, in, uh, here you go, in chapter 5, he said, if this is from God, beginning in chapter, it's a long passage, I'm not going to read it all, uh, chapter 5, 33 through 40, Gamaliel, who's the chief rabbi of, of the age, says to the Sanhedrin, if this is not from God, just like these other people rose up and they disappeared, they're all going to disappear. Right? If it is from God, you can't stop it. So we recommend here that you don't try, right, Sanhedrin. So they bring in Peter and all the disciples, and they beat them with rods. <laughs> They're not about to let it go, just let it go. And then they go back out and keep preaching. Well, the Sanhedrin at this point is afraid of them because there are so many people listening to them, and they are not preaching and teaching in, uh, in secret. They're going to the courtyard of the temple where crowds gather, and they're openly doing it. And the temple guards are afraid to arrest them because they're so popular. But there's a growing hostility here between the Pharisees and the Sadducees who actually control the temple grounds and these new Jewish 
Christians or followers of the way. So the first point I want to make is that the animosity and the conflict between traditional Judaism and this new religion starts within days of Pentecost. It's, it's popular today to say, well, you know, Christianity was part of Judaism and we forced them out. Well, Christianity was part of Judaism. It was not seen as an independent religion at this point. And no, we didn't force them out. I'm going to show you it's the other way around. Now, I also have to say that after that happened, we have persecuted them unmercifully for 2,000 years. <laughs> So we bear a lot of guilt and blame here. But the split is caused by the Jewish leaders. And the move toward uh, Gentiles starts not very quickly, about two decades after these events in Jerusalem. What happens is, you know the story of the stoning of Stephen. Stephen is the, one of the first deacons He's arrested for preaching about Jesus. Uh, he's condemned by the Sanhedrin. They take him out and stone him. And Acts says, and there was a young man named Saul who was a witness. He was an official witness. Right. And we learn in, in chapter 18 of Acts, he was an official witness because he studied under a rabbi Gamaliel, who was the most famous rabbi of his age, and so he was more than qualified to be a judge here. But this event causes all of the Christians in the area around Jerusalem to flee. They get out of town. Only the apostles remain. But those people go to places like Damascus. They go to Antioch and Syria. They go down to Egypt. They go to Arabia. And so Christianity is now beginning to spread because the Jews killed Stephen and threatened all the rest of them. So when we get to Paul and his conversion experience, Paul is going to Damascus to try and arrest all the Christians that he can to bring them back to Jerusalem for trial by the Sanhedrin. Now, why would he go to Damascus, another province, country, Syria, thinking he could grab all these people and bring them back in chains. Well, he could because he had a warrant, essentially, for the arrest of anybody he found. And secondly, one of the largest concentration of Jews in the East was in Damascus. Later on, there's a persecution that uh, a, a historian Josephus writes about, where over a course of a few days, the rest of the citizens killed 18,000 Jews. And that wasn't all of them. So Paul is going there because this is an enormous concentration of Jews. Well, you know this story of, you know, he hears a voice, the light, he's struck blind, he goes to Damascus. Well, he goes down to Arabia for three years. He goes up to Jerusalem because they don't know who he is. He only meets with Peter and James the, uh, the Lord's brother, not James the Apostle, the Lord's brother, and he says one or two others, and, and they accept his ministry. And this is where he begins. He goes out, and for 14 years, he is preaching the gospel in the Mediterranean, right? Starting in a place called Antioch of Pisidia, and, and then the, the main Antioch, and he is making disciples. But who is he making disciples uh, from? Where is he going? Well, when Paul and Barnabas start out, in chapter 13, uh, verse 5, it says, they are on Cyprus now. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue. And John was with them. They are only preaching in synagogues. They're not going out among the Gentiles. So the only Christians that are being made are Jews, Gentiles who've converted to Judaism, 
and one other group of people. Throughout the Mediterranean at this period, in the Greco-Latin area, if you will, Greco-Roman, there were a number of people who were called God-fearing Gentiles. God-fearing Gentiles are those Gentiles, Cornelius, the first Gentile brought into the church, is, is one of them, baptized by Peter, who were highly taken with this worship of this God, Yahweh, particularly because of its moral foundations. They keep the Jewish laws, that is, they keep you know, what's called kashrut, they keep kosher tables. They're allowed to go to synagogue. Now, there's a special place for them, but they're allowed, and they do go to synagogue, and they study Torah. But they have not taken the final step of becoming Jewish. Can you guess why? It becomes a big problem later on for Paul. Circumcision. Yeah. Uh, didn't Saul, after he spent three years in Arabia, go back to Tarsus before he went to Antioch? Yes, there's a, yeah. yes, he did, but that's where they start the 14 years where we're, we're going to get yeah. to later okay. on in Acts 15 and in Galatians. He's out there for 14 years. Yes, he goes to Jerusalem, then he goes home, and then he is commissioned to go out and spread the gospel along with Barnabas and initially John Mark and and a man who shows up again and again named Silas. So it's circumcision. And it's not simply that circumcising an adult male is painful. In this culture, Greeks and Romans regularly go to work out in what they call the gymnasium, which is actually just a big field where they throw discus and javelins and run around, right? And they go to public baths, and they do so Naked. And it's considered sort of an abomination to be circumcised. So whereas the Jews look at it as a sign of the covenant, the Roman world just thinks, what a savage, primitive custom. And so a lot of these people who follow Judaism are not disposed to go to the next step. And... The Jewish, there are no rabbis, by the way. That term doesn't come into use for another 200 years. But the people who are essentially acting as rabbis do not encourage making proselytes. That is, do not encourage going out and bringing people into the Jewish religion. And this is important for us right, today. And the reason they don't do that is because once you accept circumcision as a, as a male, you go through the ritual bath, mikvahs, and so forth as a woman, you have taken on yourself the obligation to obey all 635 laws that are found in the Old Testament. And, and they say, look, it's a burden that's been too hard for us to bear, even though we were born into this, and you need to think long and hard before you voluntarily take this on because the law, Torah, was not given to you. I'm going to repeat that. The law of God, as we have it, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy was not given to anyone in this room unless you have Jewish ancestors. Right. So what does that mean? We, we regularly tell people, you have to obey the Ten Commandments. They weren't given to us. They weren't. They were given to the Jews. I know Christians who won't eat pork because it's in the Bible. That wasn't given to us. Go ahead. I'm sorry, John, I want to go back to the 200 years and then they started using the word rabbi. <clears throat> so the apostles did not call Jesus rabbi, right? Yes, but not as a title. Rabbi, in its actual base meaning, just means teacher. 
Right. But later on, it becomes an ordained clergy oh, office. Oh, and that's the 200 years later. That's the 200 years. Right. Okay. But yes, they did call him. I'll still and, watch The Chosen then. <laughs> <laughs> and in the, in, in certain places in the Bible, the, uh, some of the more modern translations, when they call Jesus rabbi, just uh, either translate teacher or master. So we have, uh, we have this growing movement that sees itself as Jewish. They do not see themselves as a separate religion. They see themselves as Jews who have accepted Jesus as the promised Messiah. That's a big difference. What they do with the Gentiles, and that creates a real problem. Because now we get to a point where the uh, teaching of Paul and Barnabas starts to get them into trouble. So uh, in Antioch, for example, in chapter 13 of Acts, in verse 46, it says, Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. They've been going, they've been going to the synagogue services for weeks, months, right, and teaching. And they're beginning to get real objections from the rulers of the synagogue. So Luke writes, Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had, to, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles and you, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So at this point, you have the situation where for the first time, Paul has said a pox on the synagogue. I'm tired of dealing with you people. He's been actually beaten, threatened, and all this stuff. He said, now it's the Gentiles who are actually listening to me, and not the righteous Gentiles who are already like God. It's other Gentiles, and I'm gone. Now, is he? And the answer is no. <laughs> Because in the next few chapters, he goes to these various cities and he is preaching where? In the synagogue, right? So Daniel's going to take up Corinth, I think, the Corinthian letter. So in, by chapter 18, Paul has been all over, and now he's in Corinth. And I, I want to read, actually, let me read two passages. The first one will get out of the way, and then the second one. Beginning in verse 4, chapter 18. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks, again, the righteous Gentiles. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was Messiah. Remember in Antioch, he said, I'm done with you, right? Well, he can't quite give up yet. So in Corinth, he's now preaching exclusively to the Jews in the synagogue. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he goes next door to the synagogue uh, he left the synagogue, went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, that would be a Gentile. And Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who, who heard Paul believed and were baptized. That's the beginning of the church in Corinth that we will get the letters to. And it is already, from the very beginning, unlike the other churches that Paul found that are principally Jewish, this one is what? It's already mixed in more than a little Gentile. So we have a problem here, and that is, how is this going to work? And if Jews are not allowed to uh, have anything to do with Gentiles, which is true in Jerusalem, but if you live in Corinth and you live in Athens and you live in other places, you don't have any choice if you're going to buy and sell goods. But they don't eat together. They don't have uh, services together. 
They, they keep as much apart as possible. So a problem develops. Some Pharisees come and they look at what Paul's doing and they go, you can't do this. If Christians are going, if the Christian movement is going to include Gentiles, they have to become what? Fully Jewish. So here this question of circumcision and all the rest of things is suddenly right on the horizon and can't be avoided anymore. So Paul and uh, Timothy, is it? Titus, go to uh, oh, uh, Jerusalem. And he said, we have to have an answer to this question. So why would he go to Jerusalem? Who's he going to see? James, James, Peter, and those apostles who are still in Jerusalem because they've spread out by now. I think I told you that Thomas first went first to Damascus and then winds up in India, right? Matthew's in uh, Syria and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, stuff going on outside the Roman Empire that's not in our Bible because Acts only is concerned with Paul and getting to Rome, not the spread of the gospel around the rest of the world. But the mother church of the world, if you want to call it that, is in Jerusalem. It's, it's still the place from which rules and edicts come. Why? Because most of these people are Jews, and why? You look to Jerusalem for leadership. Plus, you look to the apostles. So Paul goes and makes his case. And in chapter 15, it's called the Council of Jerusalem. It's, if, if this is the same council in uh, Galatians, Paul has been preaching among the Gentiles for 14 years, Jews and Gentiles. It's taken that long for this to surface as the kind of problem that has to have a council to settle it. So he goes back and he says, God has been working wonders among the Gentiles. And they agree, saying that we can't deny that. God is reaching out to the Gentiles. How will Jewish Christians respond? So let's open it up for a minute. How do Jewish Christians respond? What's the answer? Without reading in particulars, we're going to go into it here. There's a, there's a huge split here. And what is the split between Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians? No, I would think that it's the uh, old traditional Jewish way of living, and it's just a difficult thing to give up completely to become mm. Christian. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, there are Christian Jews now, which they've they've given up that mm -hmm. thing. So I think it's the same kind of thing. It's just a hard thing to give up. But do they have to? Do they have to? Yeah. No. Do Jewish Christians have to stop being practicing Jews at this point? No. Offering the, uh, being part of the evening morning and evening sacrifice of the temple? Temple's still here. By the way, we don't know. We're somewhere... Uh, probably 48 to 50 somewhere in this council takes place, which is only, what, 16 years or so since the death of Jesus. I want to read you the response that James makes, and, and I want you to know what's not in this. This is in uh, Acts chapter 15, verses 20, I'm going to read a lot, I'm not going to read all the, pre yeah, um, I should. Then the apostles and elders, beginning with verse 22, with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, 
to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and, and Cilicia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word, or mouth, uh, by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meat of strangled animals, from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. It doesn't sound like much, does it? Right. That's it? And the answer is, yeah, that's it. None of the Torah commandments are what? Imposed on Gentiles. But what's not there? This is not a trick question. What about the Jewish Christians? Do they relieve the Jewish Christians of any observance of the law? No, they do not. We're now in the late 40s, early 50s. New Gentile Christians don't have to keep what? The dietary laws. They don't have to do the ritual baths. They don't have to offer turtle dove sacrifices for sin. They don't have to do any of that stuff. Do the Jews still have to do that? And the answer is yes. Now, I've got to say about blood, why is that so important? In the ninth chapter of Genesis, when Noah comes out of the ark and God makes a covenant with him, it's called the Noahic covenant. You can't kill anybody. You need to sacrifice and, and worship God only, and you may not what? eat blood of any kind. If you kill something, you've got to drain it completely because the blood is the life of the animal and it belongs to God, not you. So let's go forward a couple thousand years, right? Is there anybody on earth that remembers this Noahic covenant and keeping it? And the answer is no. So the Gentiles are completely you know, out of touch with what God requires. So in the 17th chapter of Leviticus, God repeats in detail, beginning with chapter 17, uh, any Israel, uh, chapter, uh, verse 8, any Israelite or any foreigner residing among them who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice does not bring it to the entrance to the tent of meeting to sacrifice it to the Lord must be cut off from the people and I will set my face against any Israelite or any foreigner residing among them who eats blood. I will cut them off from the people. So that's the only commandment from Leviticus that's put on Gentiles. Why? Because it's one of the very few in the Law of Moses that applies to Gentiles as well as it does to so now we've got a situation where we have a set of rules for Jewish Christians that they're expected to follow. Right? We have a whole other growing set of Christians who are what? Released from all those laws. And yet they're supposed to be together in the same congregations and gatherings, supposed to come together for the same Lord's Supper, how do you think that works? Not at all. The rest of Paul's ministry in his letters, in almost every one of them, he is now struggling with the Jewish factor who says, no, you've got to be circumcised. Because, why? Because this ain't working. How can we be true to all the 635 commandments, including purity, and sit down at table with you 
and you haven't even washed your hand. I mean, it's, it becomes more and more difficult to hold this together. And in the end, they don't. So uh, what eventually happens? The, this blows up to the point where in Galatians, we don't have time, we're not going to go through all of it, Paul has to take Peter head on and said, you've got to choose. Either you're going to be with a Christian church uh, that includes all people and act that way or not. But you can't flip-flop back and forth anymore. You've got to choose. And this is fairly early because Galatians also is one of the early letters where this comes to a head. So in this period, the growing Christian movement now is head on against traditional Judaism, both in the church and in the communities where they live. So I wanted to read this passage because it's, I had sort of skipped over it. It's 18, chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, the, the emperor, had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. We don't know exactly when that was. Somewhere between, had to have been somewhere between 41 when he became emperor in the early 50s when he died. A lot of scholars believe somewhere around 46, so this is pretty early, right? Why did he throw, this is not in the Bible, but why did God throw all the Jews out of Rome? Right. Exactly. They were rioting in the Jewish quarter. Why? They were rioting, rioting against the Christians. It had gotten to the point where the Jews and the Christians were, and the Jewish Christians were stoning each other and beating each other with clubs in, this, in the street. And Claudius said, we will have none of that in Rome and threw them out. All of them. He didn't care. This is an anti-Semitic, anti-Christian. He didn't care who, it's a man named Suetonius writes about, it. he doesn't care who's to blame here. He just says, I'm not having it. You were banished from Rome. That's why Priscilla and Aquila, who are Jews, Paul meets them in Corinth. Uh, and just as a historical aside, When Claudius dies, this edict is still in effect. It's never, uh, it's never called back, right? But since he's dead, the Jews just did what? They just got on their little carts and boats and went back into town. <laughs> and it was over. But the reason for bringing this up is to show that this, this antagonism now is beginning to spread around the world and it's gotten violent between Christians and Jews. So in the little time I want to talk about, Jews, Christians still see themselves as followers of the way and, and what the Jews call the sect of the Nazarenes. They don't want to leave Judaism. Christianity is now growing much faster. We're, we're back into the 50s, 60s now. Among the, among the uh, Gentiles than it is the Jews. So what happens that causes the final split where the two of us part company for 2,000 years? It's the destruction of the temple. After the destruction of the temple, those who survived and and, and that war went on long after the destruction of the temple. 
hundreds and hundreds of thousands of more people died. The people who were then, had been the Sanhedrin, doesn't exist anymore because the Sanhedrin was what? Pharisees and Sadducees. There are no more Sadducees. That was the temple group of priests. So the Pharisees, before Jerusalem falls, they get out of town, they go to a place called Yavna, which is northeast of Jerusalem, and they set up a sort of mini Sanhedrin. Well, when the temple falls, they have to do exactly what we were talking about last week. They've got to figure out what happens to Judaism as they have known it when almost all of it is destroyed. It has to what? Reconstitute itself around the synagogue. So how do you then come together to take a look at the laws in Torah and apply them now to synagogues and not to a temple that doesn't exist anymore? So a man named Gamaliel II, it's the father of the one that Paul, uh, I mean son of the one that Paul studied under. This is from the Jewish Encyclopedia. I just went ahead and printed this out. Uh, Jewish timeline and uh, encyclopedia. This happens in the year 76 of the Roman reckoning. There's something called the Birkat Haminom, and that is uh, 18, it means 18. There are 18 blessings that are recited every day in the synagogues, but they're not standardized. And so Gamaliel uh, says to uh, uh, some of the people that are there with him, he says, we need to take a look at all 18 of these and we need to standardize them so everybody in the world in any synagogue is saying the same thing. So far that makes sense, right? But he commissions a 19th benediction, right? And this is the 19th. It's actually inserted in the middle, but it's still called the 18 blessings, but it is in fact 19 since the year 76. And this is what it says. For the apostates, let there be no hope and uproot the kingdom of arrogance speedily and in our days. May the Nazarenes and the sectarians perish in a moment. Let them be blotted out of the book of life and not be written together with the righteous. You are praised, O Lord, who subdues the area. That is the moment at which Judaism ejected Christians. Whether you were Gentile or Jewish, you were no longer part of Israel. And over the years, if a son or daughter, for example, became a Christian, you were supposed to what? Count them as dead, never talk to them again. Now, this blessing if you have access to a uh, oh, uh, prayer book, the morning prayers, where it's called Shimoni Ezra, the uh, 18 blessings, and you look at number 12, it doesn't say that anymore. It says all the way up to the sect of the Nazarenes and takes it out. Not because uh, they had a change of heart. Because in the Middle Ages in Europe, persecution against Jews was absolutely intense. Uh, they were put into ghettos, they were slaughtered, they were chased from country to country. And Christian scholars were learning to read what? Hebrew. And you don't want your prayer book with a curse on the largest you know, group in the world, the majority, to say, we curse you. And so the change comes for self-protection. So now it just curses heretics, and we're part of it. So it sounds like I'm saying, well, they caused all this. Actually, no, they didn't. They had to, when the Babylonian captivity took place and the first temple was destroyed, they had to come to some explanation of why God would do that to them. 
And their explanation was they had forgotten the law and didn't keep it. So when the second temple is destroyed, they have to figure out how is it that this catastrophe happened? Well, they have to blame somebody. And they blame the apostasy of uh, not only the Christians, but also the Samaritans that brought down God's wrath on righteous Jews. Our response, by the way, from early on was, can you guess what? To consider them murderers of Jesus, hated by God, and we hounded and persecuted them for the next 2,000 years. Long after they quit <laughs> cursing us, we're still what? Putting swastikas on synagogue doors. And so what I wanted to say is early Christianity owes its existence to a continuation with Judaism. Paul tells us that it couldn't have gone any further if God hadn't put a hardening on the heart of the Jews. But that was for our sake. And Paul goes on to say, and don't for a moment think that you're special, Gentiles, because God still thinks we're special and we've invited you into the family. And so what does all this mean for us today? It means to me two things. Number one, we need to quit thinking that Christianity as we know it sprung full blown out of the earth or from heaven on one day and, and that's how we got to be here. And Christianity has developed over the course of thousands of years, meeting new situations, new populations, new challenges. And we need to be open to the fact that the Holy Spirit is leading it and no, we don't look like we did in the beginning and we're not gonna in 10, 20 years from now look like we do now. It's God who, who does that. And when Jesus says, Paul says, all Jews will be saved, how can that be? Well, you know what? Paul doesn't say, God doesn't say, and basically what he's saying is that's up to me and it's none of your business. <laughs> Well, thank you, John. Um, our time is almost up, but you know what John has done this morning is to just give us a snippet of kind of this long, tortuous history mm -hmm. and uh, the kind of uh, coexistence of Judaism and Christianity. And um, I, I think one of the things that we would do is to look at Romans 9 through 11 and study this in depth. But I, I think something that is important from what John has said is this question of supersessionism. Uh, do, do we as Christians, you know, supplant or take the place of Judaism? I think a lot of Christians will always say, well, you've got to be a Christian before you will be saved. All of God saves us. And I think what Paul is saying, Judaism and Christianity and all the others, leave the saving to God. And what we have to do is to understand the history, how we came, and that's what John has said. You know, this uncomfortable kind of sitting side by side between Judaism and Christianity. And it's all something that God only can sort out. And it is not our job to say, well, you're a Jew, you're going to hell, you're a Christian, you're going to hell. Leave that, you know, to God. That would be another thing that we, that we know we would talk about. But I think this morning, John, we kind of very uh, pleased with this history about how Christianity came, how we emerged from Judaism, but it was uncomfortable. He talked about, um, you know, the empress, and after Claudius, several kind of a couple came, and then Nero came. He destroyed, you know, everything, blamed the Christians, the fire of Rome, and then the temple destroyed. It's a long, long history, and so we just want to thank you, John, for this, uh, you know, beautiful Aspect. Any question, any comment before we. Oh, yes, sir. This is what makes me always go back to the very last supper when Jesus said, My last commandment is love each other as I have loved you. It's as simple as that. And 
thousands and thousands of years after all this quarreling you're talking about, people are not remembering what real Christianity is. And it's, it's really simple. It's what he said at the Last Supper. And that is what really impacts me and I care about the most. Sorry. Okay, well, let's end our time with prayer, and uh, we can uh, begin our fellowship, uh, coffee and water and tea out there. Father, we thank you for your word and for this rich, veritable history of how we came uh, and, uh, and through your power and spirit just spread to the ends of the, of the earth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a gospel of grace, a gospel of compassion. And Father, as we think about our history and about the, the wars and the, the fights and uh, the uncomfortable nature that exists between us in Judaism, as well as even among other religions, may we remember that you are the God of creation. And only what you, God, what you do, it's what we need to embrace. And so help us to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be loving, compassionate, and also just uh, allow you to save us and save others through us for your kingdom. Now, Father, we ask that as we transition to our worship service, that again, you will continue to speak to our hearts and our minds and just help us to abandon ourselves on you as you use us uh, to bless this world. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you.